uh, it's time, so let me get started. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Fez uh, from Texas Instruments India, and today I'm going to be talking about the UFS subsystem uh, inside kernel and in U-boot. So, uh, just like a show of hands, how many of you have worked on UFS or are planning to work on UFS? Oh, quite a few people. Nice. So le let me get started. A uh, little bit about me. I've been working with Texas Instruments India for the past, from uh, 2017. I've worked on uh, peripheral drivers for various TISOCs, uh, mainly including MMC, CAN, and now UFS. Uh, this presentation is a result of my work uh, uh, mainline, uh, getting the UFS subsystem into mainline U-boot. So what exactly is UFS? Uh, primarily, it's a managed flash, as a lot of you guys must know. Uh, now, flashes uh, are not very reliable. And that is why, uh, in most of today's applications, they come together with a flash controller in a single chip. Um, so th there are things like black, uh, bad block management, uh, ECC where, where leveling where uh, uh, some memory addresses might go bad or you might read the wrong address or uh, if you continuously erase uh, a given address it might uh, it might the flash might give out at that address so uh, because of all this you require a flash controller to manage the flash uh, the second thing is uh, and uh, so in today's systems, you can have, the, you can have a host uh, uh, communicating with a defined communication protocol with the flash. And, in, and then the, the host does not really have to worry about uh, uh, like how much flash is there or uh, how many lines uh, I need to go attach to the flash. It's the communication protocol uh, will uh, just help the host uh, send a command and get uh, whatever um, uh, data from this memory address to this memory address uh, as it wants. So the most, uh, some of the most used uh, communication protocols for flash subsystems are MMC, SATA, SPY, uh, we just had a hyperflash uh, talk in forum one, I guess most of you were there. Um, moving on to uh, why UFS, it's uh, so it's a very high performance serial interface and it's, uh, and it's supposed to take very less power. So uh, in any, any of your low power devices, your uh, cell phones, low power laptops, etc., cetera, you, um, UFS will be very useful. It's, um, in, all, in all of our, most of our smartphones up till 2015 or 16 we had, EMMC storage, uh, which is, uh, which, I mean, is fast, but uh, UFS is, uh, has a lot of features that are uh, on top of it, that are better than it. So, uh, unlike EMMC, uh, UFS can have uh, bi-directional full duplex transfer speeds up to 1.45 Gbps, which is in UFS 3.0. Uh, uh, HS Gear 4. Uh, and UFS, uh, because they want to replace uh, EMC and SD cards, both of them, you can have removable storage as well as uh, storage uh, that is soldered on the board. Bytes. Yeah. Um, so a comparison between EMC and UFS uh, to just uh, bring home the fact how much better it is. <laughs> so, uh, EMMC 5.1, which is the latest standard, has I/O speeds of up to 400 Mbps, as compared to uh, UFS 1.45 Gbps, um, and it it takes up uh, much lesser power while transferring data. So, EMMCs work from anywhere from between 1.2 volts to 3.3 volts while UFS works at 0.2 to 0.4 differential. Um, 
Also, the random uh, read speeds for UFS are much faster. It's 68,000 IO operations per second as compared to MMC's 13,000. Um, and the protocol is also better. So uh, in EMMC, you can uh, either be reading or writing the data at one point of time because it has a share. It has uh, the same bus for both reads and writes. In the case of UF that that's not the case in UFS, where you have uh, different differential lines for input data and output data. Um, and also, because it's a newer standard, you have a bigger address space inside the device. So you can go up till 16 TB of space. Um, so moving on to uh, UFS, uh, the overall, uh, how does the overall system looks in both kernel and in U-boot? Um, so this is a represent, simplified representation of how uh, a UFS device will appear to a, to a host. Uh, there will be uh, a bunch of logical units, uh, which I will explain what, the, what they are later, and, uh, and a separate memory for configuration of these logical units. Uh, going down, to, down the stack, you have the UFS interconnect layer, which is the f uh, physical and data link layers that, uh, uh, that connect the host to the device. Um, then you have the U UFS transport layer implemented as the, the UFS driver in Linux. And then the UFS application layer, which is implemented by the SCSI driver in, uh, in Linux. Um, so this diagram will, is basically going to represent what, every, what, what I'm going to say in this whole uh, talk. Let's start with the application layer. So the UFS application. Second, huh. Huh. The UFS application layer is based on the SCSI command set and the SCSI architecture model. They basically picked up the simplified uh, SCSI set and the UFS device uh, will uh, follow this protocol. So if you guys are uh, familiar with the SCSI protocol, it uh, consists of transactions based on uh, units called command descriptor blocks and each command descriptor block needs to define an initiator, which is the host device, a target, which is the, target, which is the UFS device, and a specific LUN, which uh, is a logical unit inside the device, and a query. So a query is basically, uh, uh, it, it's the opcode of the command that you want to send. So you can have read, uh, write, uh, read uh, the device capacity, read uh, what all logical units are there inside the device, uh, et cetera. So most CDBs are six bytes long, although you have uh, 10 and 16 byte long uh, CDBs as well. Um, so these are some of the uh, important commands that, I, uh, that you will be sending uh, as part of the UFS uh, uh, during UFS operations. So obviously read and write. Uh, then next is read capacity. So if you target a logical unit, it will tell you how big uh, the logical unit in terms of uh, the block size of the uh, UFS device. Next is report LUNs. Uh, during enumeration, you can find out which logical units are active and which have been and what uh, logical unit number they have been assigned to. Uh, the next one is test unit ready. You can send this to a logical unit to find out uh, whether it's ready to accept your other queries and read write commands or not. Uh, the next is a start stop unit, which uh, is basically used to switch power uh, of the UFS device. So you can go from active mode to a low power mode to a completely power down mode and back to active mode using this. Uh, the next one is inquiry. You can send it to a logical unit to get some other uh, information about the logical unit, like what is the vendor ID, uh, uh, how, uh, whether this logical unit is writable or not, things like that. Uh, these are the, some of the more important commands, but the com actual command list uh, you can go and read inside the spec. Uh, it's a lot more elaborate than this. 
so I've been talking about logical units all this time. Uh, I guess it's, it's time to define what they are. A every, every UFS device will co contain a set number of uh, l logical units, each of which you can assign uh, the complete UFS capacity to. So uh, for example, I, I'll say this logical unit, uh, I, I'll assign it 100 MB. And the le next one uh, will have, uh, let's say, 400 MB of, of the complete device uh, storage. So the complete the device capacity can be mapped to all of these logical units. And it's not necessary that you uh, that uh, if eight logical units are defined, you need to assign memory to all of them. You can have just some of them enabled. Uh, usually, in our system, we'll have one boot logical unit from in which all the boot images are present, and there'll be a root file system logical unit. Uh, the good thing is that this is not the only configuration that you can do per logical unit. You, there are a bunch of other uh, properties of logical units that you can configure. Uh, things like write protection, uh, whether it's a boot logical unit or not, which uh, means that you can do a boot operation on that logical unit. So a boot operation uh, is basically used to get uh, bootloader images from an internal uh, SOC ROM. Uh, while enumerating, while your device is undergoing enumeration. Um, uh, during boot operation, your, uh, the UFS full stack will, like, there is a, uh, it only comes up halfway and only enables the boot run. So you can uh, fetch the uh, bootloaded uh, images much faster. Uh, that's correct. That's correct. It's similar to EMMC. Uh, but uh, if you are in uh, in EMMC, you have to predefine which uh, what address, what image you are actually going to send. So in EMMC, the ROM just needs to send you one command, and uh, it's predefined what image the device is sending back. In this case, you can actually choose. Uh, there is like a proper read command with which you can choose. Okay, this is the address I want to go and read at, basically. Um, the next uh, property of uh, LUNs that you can set in UFS is memory type. So there are four uh, me memory types uh, that are possible. Default is your normal <coughs> root file system memory type. So uh, you can read, write, uh, modify memory like it's the default type. System code is used for uh, uh, memory that is not uh, updated, that is not written to a lot, uh, like very often. For example, boot memory. Uh, you only need to go and update the firmware or and the booter images once in a while. So it's optimized for reading, and you'll have much faster reads. Uh, the next one is non-persistent. If you set your logical unit to be non-persistent, uh, it means that uh, it's not. It ba it's basically non-volatile. So you can, uh, the application is you can have it as a swap space uh, to extend your uh, virtual memory space uh, uh, from the RAM. Um, a few more uh, properties are basically priority access. So you can set it such that some logical units uh, ha have a higher priori priority uh, over others. So those tasks uh, assigned to those logical units will get done faster and they'll report back faster than others. Uh, and uh, the last one is RPMB. Uh, people familiar with uh, EMMC, this uh, is replay protected memory block, which b basically means you need a cryptographic uh, algorithm to go and access this memory, and you need to uh, provide hashes and uh, keys to access this type of memory. Um, going ahead. Uh, now, uh, the spec defines the uh, number of LUNs to be limited to 32 LUNs, but uh, in the devices that I have used and in most devices, the number is usually eight. Uh, aside from these logical units, you can have four more well-known logical units which are sort of special. And uh, each of those has a separate uh, uh, function. So 
the first one is the report, and the, these logical unit numbers will be special. So any report lens logical unit will have this number, or a UFS device logical unit will have this number. Um, so the first one is report lens. Uh, this, is, this is the logical unit you need to uh, address your report lens SCSI request to. And it will return you what configuration, uh, what, which lens are active on the device and uh, what their numbers are. Um, next, you have the uh, UFS device learn. Any inquiry uh, request that you need to send goes to this. Um, yeah, and you, you can uh, basically use it to do a lot of configurations inside the device. Uh, next is you can set any LUN to a boot LUN, like I just said. Uh, and it'll basically, once you set it as a boot LUN, you, you can access it using this uh, logical unit number. Uh, next is RPMB, uh, which is the security uh, protocol uh, protected memory. Uh, yeah. Moving ahead, uh, this is a representation of how the, uh, how Linux, uh, the SCSI driver brings up a UFS device. Uh, the first thing after detecting uh, a device as a UFS host is it'll send the report. It'll send the report lens command, and after getting this response, you have it knows okay these logical unit numbers are active, and I can go and start uh, reading and writing from them. But before that, uh, what I need to do is I need to know the capacity uh, of each of these logical units and basically uh, save it uh, on, on the software side. Um, uh, and after this, uh, so uh, once these uh, uh, steps are done, your uh, uh, logical units will uh, show up as uh, SCSI devices under slash dev, slash uh, like SDA, SDB, things like that. So after this, you are free to do read, write accesses depending on how your logical units are configured. Uh, going ahead, uh, going down the stack to the UFS interconnect layer. Uh, this is implemented by the MIPI-5 uh, physical layer standard and the MIPI UniPro data link uh, standard. Uh, these are, you can go to the MIPI uh, website to read more about these standards. Um, but what I'm gonna, is, uh, so the interconnect layer defines what signals are uh, present in the device. Uh, it's just four signals. So there is a reset signal, which is used to reset the device and uh, bring it back to a known state. The reference clock, um, the, and a pair of in, input and output uh, differential signals. So D in underscore T is the uh, higher uh, voltage of the differential signal, underscore C is the lower voltage. And uh, you can have up to two of these lanes. So a pair of D in and D out, uh, and another pair of D in and D out. You can have up to two of these, uh, as defined in the standard. And uh, the physical layer also defines uh, a bunch of high-speed gears that uh, the UFS device can go up to. So at HS gear one, you have you can go up to a maximum data route of 182 Mbps. At gear two, you can go to 64 Mbps. At gear three, you can go to 728 Mbps. And at the highest gear, gear four, about 1.4 uh, Gbps. Um, next, uh, what is defined inside the interconnect layer is the UFS power modes. Um, so because it's a low power device and you're supposed to use it with in uh, portable low power devices, it needs to have uh, some a power, a low power mode in, into which it can go to. Um, so uh, the first mode that you will usually have is the active mode. This is when your UFS device is, uh, is basically processing some request. So you have sent, send a SCSI command to it and it's processing a request to send back to you. Uh, in, in active mode, you can have up to 16 levels of, uh, of power consumption, uh, 16 levels of power consumption. So the highest level, uh, 15 will have the highest level of power consumption and hence performance. 
and zero will have the lowest uh, amount of power consumption and performance. Why does this exist is because you, can, you might have a use case such that uh, most of the times your device is not is running off battery. So at that point of time, it should be consuming lesser power while active. But at other points of time, when you go and actually plug in your device, now it has a greater current that it can, and greater power that it can, that it has access to. And it can go to a high, higher active ICC level and do, uh, and do your requests faster, basically. Uh, after your device is done uh, doing, uh, after your device is done uh, doing any background operations or, acts or uh, uh, replying to your request, it automatically goes into idle mode, which is a lower power mode. The, there is no software uh, intervention required here. The third one is your UFS uh, sleep mode. Uh, this is a much lesser power consuming mode as compared to your idle mode. You, at this point, you can't... Uh, uh, access any of the logical units, you can't send uh, any commands, you can't access data, and it's possible to remove some of the power from the uh, UFS device. The third uh, power mode is the power down mode. At this point of time, uh, like it's, it's, way, it's at, at an even lower power level than sleep mode. At this point of time, uh, if you had any uh, non-volatile uh, storage in, inside the UFS device that will be lost if you go to down to power mode, power down mode, and you can remove all uh, power from the device. Uh, now these, this sleep and power down mode are uh, like they match very well with the uh, Linux uh, power management ops, and therefore you you can. Uh, you can basically have callbacks to runtime suspend, runtime resume, uh, suspend and resume uh, in, your, in your particular driver. So if you, uh, uh, I mean, if you have, if you assign these uh, callbacks in your particular driver, your, the UFS HD platform driver will automatically switch it to sleep mode or power down mode depending on uh, the situation. And uh, as I have already said, all of these power modes are set using the start stop unit uh, SCSI command. The start stop unit SCSI command. Uh, moving ahead. Um, now the UFS transport layer. This is the layer in which, uh, which is like unique to the UFS spec itself. Uh, so the UFS spec took up SCSI drivers for its, the SCSI protocol for its upper layer and the MIPI and M5 layers for its interconnect layer. But this is, is like sort of unique to uh, UFS. Uh, so the, uh, the minimum unit of transaction in UFS at, at the transport layer is called a UFS protocol information unit or a UPIU. Um, uh, at this layer, you again have an initiator and a target uh, I mean, a host and device uh, configuration. Uh, there are different types of UPIUs. You can, you have different, you have them for commands, you have them for data operations, you want to, for task management operations, or for qu queries uh, to the device. And each transaction, each SCSI transaction that you get from the application layer uh, will convert to a command UPIU, uh, zero or more data UPIUs, and one response UPIU. And each UPIU uh, contains a 12-byte uh, header uh, at the beginning of it, and the, the, uh, which is common to all UPIUs, and the rest of them uh, is, and the rest of the uh, UPIU structure depends on uh, which actual UPIU you're trying to send. So on the left side, uh, I'll keep the UPIU header uh, uh, constant so and highlight the some particular features of it and uh, what it basically the header corresponds to a lot of the features that you have in the transport layer so it's it's good to have it on one side um, so th this slide explains the types of UPIUs that exist in the UFS transport layer uh, the first and they are uh, and they are different UPIUs for the initiator and the target. So an, uh, an initiator will send a nope out UPIU 
and receive a NOP in UPIO. And uh, similarly for all of these others. Um, so NOP out and NOP in are used to check uh, whether you have a connection to the device or not. It's basically used for debugging. So if you have a connection to a device and if you're able to access the LAN, you will get back a NOP in UPIO, which is a good indicator of whether that all your lower level interconnect uh, layers have come up properly and are functional. Uh, next is uh, the command UPIU. So your UFS SCSI CDB will be embedded into this command UPIU and sent to the UFS device. And, you, the, and correspondingly, you should get a response from the target. Uh, the next is data, data out UPIU. Uh, it's to write data to the device. Data in UPIU is to read data from the device. That's very simple. Task management request and response <coughs> is basically uh, in each of the logical unit, you will have a task queue. And uh, once you have uh, sent a data out or data in command, you can, after that, the host can basically go ahead and remove that task and uh, either cancel the task or clear the whole task queue. Like those kind of things are task management operations and have separate UPIUs. Uh, the next important one is uh, query request. Oh. Yeah, the next important one is query request and query response. These are used for the configuration descriptors inside the uh, UFS device. <coughs> this is an example of a UTP read transaction. So you got a read, uh, read CDB from the application layer, and you convert it into a command UPIU and you get back a bunch of uh, data in UPIUs depending on uh, how much data you want to read, and it ends with the response UPIU. Now, because your host will usually be much, much faster than the tar target device, a write command needs to be uh, flow controlled with ready to transfer UPIUs. So you send a command UPIU for corresponding to a write CDB, and you get a, uh, and you get a bunch of, and you need to wait for a ready to transfer UPIU before you can send out your data out UPIUs. Because the, host, the target needs to take some time to allocate that memory and be ready to receive your data. And again, in the end, you need, you'll get a response UPIU. Uh, moving on to how the, how, how the U, UFS driver uh, represents these UPIUs in memory and how, do, how to actually do a transaction. So these are the data structures you have to be aware of. The first one is UTP transfer request descriptor, and which uh, points to a, a, a UTP transfer command descriptor, which is uh, a table of a command a UPIU, a response UPIU, and a physical re region descriptor table. So again, uh, whenever you are setting up, uh, whenever you want to send it a, a SCSI command, you go and write you go and allocate memory for a command UPIU, a response UPIU, and if it's a data command, you need to give this uh, physical region descriptor table uh, a like uh, some data that, that you have allocated. Uh, this whole structure represents one SCSI request. And, and uh, yeah. Uh, and you can have up to 32 such SCSI requests queued at one point of time. So which, which corresponds to the task tag uh, uh, entry in the UPIU header. So at one point of time, the, the different applications and, uh, can go and queue up up to 32 such requests. Uh, Yeah, uh, and also there are up to, uh, depending on how many uh, logical units you have, you can have, a, you can have task management UPIUs for uh, doing these tasks. You can do, uh, having already queued a task, you can abort it, you can abort the whole task set, you can clear everything, you can do a logical unit reset, and you, you can basically find out whether a task is queued uh, to this queue or not. Uh, so the complete structure that you need to have 
before you can start your UFS transaction is 32 command uh, UTP command descriptors, 32 UTP transfer descriptors, and uh, the UTP transfer descriptors will have the base address of the command descriptors in each of them, and also uh, a UTP, UTP ta task request descriptors. Once you have uh, uh, this whole memory, the whole data structure set up in your memory, you can go ahead with your uh, You can go ahead with your uh, commands uh, from the SCSI layer. Um, this is uh, some information about the host controller interface. Um, uh, so, I can probably skip this. Yeah. Uh, to the to the most important. Uh, uh, part of the UFS subsystem is what log logical units are there inside the device and how do I configure them? How do I say, okay, this logical unit should have uh, this much allocated memory or, and it should be right pro and it should be right protected and it should be a boot, boot logical unit. So there are a bunch of configuration structures that exist inside the device that can be read using a query request UPIU. So uh, there are three types of uh, configuration structures inside uh, inside the device. They are uh, descript they are uh, a descriptor, uh, a flag, and an attribute. And uh, all of these are uh, all of these basically define different things about the device and uh, about the various logical units that are inside it. The main thing the main uh, a descriptor that we need to worry about is the configuration descriptor. Uh, you can read the configuration descriptor uh, from the device. You can modify it such that, uh, and uh, you can basically configure it such that by allocating different uh, types of memory to different logical units, and you can write it back uh, to the device. Um, yeah, how this can be done? Uh, so yeah. Uh, Coming to the kernel implementation, you'll, you can find all the source code in drivers CASI UFS. And uh, there's a documentation file for uh, inside document, documentation CASI UFS. And the, you can find the device tree bindings uh, inside devi documentation device tree bindings UFS. Uh, the device tree bindings are very simple because this is a very uh, highly standardized uh, interface. Mostly what you need is the base address of your host controller registers and an interrupt uh, and, uh, and an interrupt that will and a top level interrupt uh, uh, property um, and a few others which are which are based on where, where you are actually uh, putting your host controller after you have uh, implemented this device tree. All you need to say is, all you need to do is call a UFS HCD platform in it from your probe, and it's done. It's as simple as that. Your UFS device should come up. Uh, so this is an example of a UFS device. It's, uh, the UFS HCD has been detected as a SCSI host. Uh, first, it came up in uh, gear one, and only one lane was active. Uh, but it quickly switched to gear three and uh, the full bus width of two lanes. Uh, it detected two well-known logical units, and none of, but none of them were a boot logical unit. And it detected normal uh, logical units, uh, SDA, which is a 32 MB, uh, which has 32 MB space inside it, and SDB, which has 32 GB space uh, allocated to it. And, uh, a, 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 and a bunch of other uh, configurations for both of them. Uh, now, uh, once, you're, once you have a UFS device, how do you access it from your user space? So the SCSI generic block layer uh, exposes your device uh, as a b block SCSI generic device, basically. So it's under slash dev slash BSD, UFS BSD. And it also exposes an ioctl with a request course SDIO, and this data structure, 
SGIO v4. Uh, if you allocate this data structure with uh, what request UPIU you want uh, and some and a response UPIU and a bunch of other structures, you can go ahead and uh, write to descriptors, uh, write uh, interconnect layer commands, uh, write to flags. You can do all of those things. Uh, now, in the wild, uh, we only have one uh, UFS utils that I have been able to find. <laughs> and uh, you can use a very simple command to read any descriptor, attribute, or flag uh, using this uh, application. Uh, examples like if you want to read the configuration descriptor, you say UFS utils descriptor, and you give the uh, path to the device. Now, this is not uh, very user-friendly because all, all this will give you is a, is a data file. Like, so you, if you hex dump that data file, you, you will have a configuration descriptor and you have to uh, basically understand wo how, what the configuration of the descriptor is, which bytes represent what to actually change it. Uh, we, really, we really need to add a very user-friendly way of uh, uh, of configuration con of config of configuring these descriptors uh, and uh, maybe I, I'll do it if I have some time later on <laughs> later uh, this year uh, uh, coming to the u-boot implementation so this uh, I added this slide recently uh, the my u-boot implementation got merged this Thursday which is nice and you should see it in the 2020.01 release uh, it also contains a very basic implementation. All you can do is, uh, if you have a UFS device on, uh, on your board, you, uh, you can send a UFS init command, which will go ahead, initialize the whole stack, uh, detect all the logical units, and register them as SCSI devices. And then you can uh, do whatever you want with those SCSI devices using the SCSI uh, commands. What it does not contain is, uh, commands to access the descriptors or flags or attributes, which I hope to add uh, later on. But patches are welcome from you guys. Um, OK, I think we are done. Uh, yeah, so how do you write these patches? First, go and reference uh, the Unifish Flash Storage 3.0 spec specification in, in the JEDIC.org uh, website, and also the host controller interface specification. And of course, uh, you can see the source code. You know where it is. Um, any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can have a scatter gather uh, list assigned to this PRDT. So you can point it to, a, to the base address, address of a scatter gather list. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, you can use this. Take a guess and say that it's uh, reliable in the sense that if you're writing to a, a block and you have a power fail, it should either not have written to that block or have the complete data written to that block. Like it should not have some uh, a halfway written corrupted data anywhere. Other than that, I don't really, I don't really think it's uh, more reliable than that. 
Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, smart data. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't really remember the kernel performance, but in U-Boot, uh, we have measured up till uh, 700 Mbps. Uh, ours is a gear three, uh, our device comes up till uh, high speed gear three, and I've measured till the maximum theoretical performance, at least in U-Boot. Um, I can get back to you on the kernel performance. No, I, I have not done that analysis yet. I can get back to you. Uh, any other questions? Fine. In that case, you can go ahead.